system does not is not really geared to what we need right now what you are asking for that is a failing and a that, failing yes it, it is a failing I mean, let's admit it the fact is the way the system was set up is that the public health component that dr uh that, that dr redfield was talking about was a system where you put it out there in the public and a physician asks for it and you get it. The okay. idea of anybody getting it easily, the way people in other countries doing it, we're not set up for that. Do I think we should be? Yes, but we're not. Early on, we were not in the situation where we could actually get the test out on a broad way. And I mentioned on the show last week that we need to get the private sector involved. And just a couple of days ago, we had the CEOs there who are going to be now putting it on full overdrive. So I would expect that very soon, when I say soon, I'm talking about days to, days to a week, where yeah. you're gonna start to see it go up like this. Not everybody tomorrow is gonna be able to get a test, but pretty soon you're gonna see a major escalation of capability and implementation. The areas of the country that are not hotspots, that are not going through the terrible ordeal that New York and California and Washington State are going through, they still have a window of significant degree of being able to contain. In other words, when you test, you find somebody, you isolate them, you get them out of circulation, and you do the contact tracing. When you have a big outbreak, it's tough to do anything but mitigation. We have an opportunity now that we have the availability of testing to do that. So you're going to be hearing more about how we can inform where we're going, particularly because we have the ability to test. What we're starting to see now in the Southern Hemisphere, in Southern Africa, and in the Southern Hemisphere countries, is that we're having cases that are appearing as they go into their winter season. And if, in fact, they have a substantial outbreak, it will be inevitable that we need to be prepared that we'll get a cycle around the second time. What does that mean for us and what we're doing? It clearly emphasizes the need to do what we're doing in developing a vaccine testing it quickly and trying to get it ready so they will have a vaccine available for that next cycle. In addition to do the randomized controlled trials of drugs so that we will have a menu of drugs that we have shown to be effective and shown to be safe. Because I know we'll be successful in putting this down now, but we really need to be prepared for another cycle. And what we're doing, I believe, will prepare as well. One second. Okay. Um, go ahead and finish jotting down your thoughts. And then as you um, have something to say, go ahead and either unmute your mic or type it in the chat about what you notice about his rhetoric as it progresses from January to March. Um, one thing I noticed um, was it was towards the beginning um, a repetition of the motif of kind of anticipating um, and uh, as we kind of got further along that motif kind of died off and I kept on hearing words like mitigate um, and America's ability so it kind of tapered off from um, kind of the anticipation of it to actually the action um, and realizing words like mitigation means that we didn't do a good job anticipating because we would be able to eliminate, not mitigate. So that's one thing I noticed. Good. So you're noticing um, almost the, the cause and effect of the particular types of rhetoric, right? So um, what tone word might you use to describe the language that the doctor is using in January? And this goes for anyone, not just...
Um, I guess the tone that I kind of see was more like matter of fact, and it wasn't too concerned where I feel like the tone as the video progressed was more not maybe concerned because he is speaking to the country, so he can't show that he is very worried. But I feel like in the beginning it was more, okay, we have a handle on this, we know what we're doing, but it's not a worry, I guess, is what I kind of saw. So would you say it shifted from like calm and matter of fact to like urgent? Yeah, more so, yeah. I would agree with that. What else do we notice? Um, like any like types of words, like what Trinity said, anything that we noticed that um, maybe like points out a particular pattern or like a particular reaction he might be trying to elicit from his audience? I feel like maybe since um, he's since more people are panicked about it, I feel like that he might be trying to like let people know what they can do to like change what's going on instead of like at the beginning where he was just like letting every know everybody know what's going on. And so now he's actually like, okay, this is what you can do and this is what we need to be doing if we want this to go away in a timely manner. Good. So perhaps the first, maybe through January, it was like informing the public, and now it's more about um, bringing the public together with a plan of action. Good. Um, some of the things that I noticed in January and February, he uses a lot of if and um, synonyms of if. So like if this were to happen, but it's not, or it is possible that this will happen, but it hasn't yet. But if it were the case, so a lot of hypotheticals. And then um, in March, it's like, oh, no longer hypothetical. It's in, it's not even inevitable. It's already happening. Um, and so there's a shift in this, the verb tense and the construction of his syntax um, that sort of characterizes the urgency that he's speaking with. And we could talk a lot about um, the effects of the audience that he's trying to go for. And we know, like, we could easily say in January, he's not wanting us to um, respond with panic, even though a lot of us did. Um, and he's wanting to make sure that we have a level head about it. But then as we get to March, he's realizing, well, now we have to embed my rhetoric with that sense of urgency. So people take these things seriously, right? Um, and so every single rhetorical choice that he makes, even if it's not a speech he's practiced, is to elicit some sort of response. Um, the other thing that I noticed in the March videos, and that could, it could be very well that the clips that were chosen um, are showing this, but he, he even cuts off some of the people interviewing him because he wants to make sure what's heard is the, the data that he has, um, not necessarily the fear embedded in the question that's being asked. Um, and then he does throw in some facts too about the 0.1% death rate of the seasonal flu versus the 1% that we have of COVID-19, which is actually 2%, but he's saying even if it were 1%, right? And so he's speaking um, almost like in retrospect about what we all, or most of us thought about this disease at the beginning. It's like, oh, we think it's just like the flu. That's what we were told by trusted people, physicians. And he's kind of going back to those moments, going back to that rhetorical situation and saying, hey, like, it actually isn't just like the flu. We were wrong. Um, and here's the data to back it up. Okay. So um, hopefully that uh, refreshes your memory on how we go about rhetorical analysis. That's just the warm up. So we're going to move on to the next order of business, um, which is uh, the 2008 prompt. Uh, so this was my senior year, so I wasn't in Lang for this, but this was back from when I was in high school, which feels like eons ago, but here we are. Um, and you notice the suggested time is 40 minutes, which is basically what you have for this exam, plus the five minute reading period and the five minute upload period. And this is the prompt that we're gonna be working with. Okay, in the following passage from The Great Influenza, an account of the 1918 flu epidemic, author J.M. Barry writes about scientists and their research. Read the passage carefully, 
Then in a well-written essay, analyze how Barry uses rhetorical strategies to characterize scientific research. The beauty of this prompt uh, is that we are told his purposes. Uh, he's characterizing scientific research and scientists. And we know that he's using rhetorical strategies. Our job is to determine what those are and then uh, explicate those effects, right? So what we're gonna do, I've portioned the text off a little bit. When I say I, I, I didn't do this. This is um, graciously shared with me from another AP Lang teacher. Um, I've sectioned it off and we have little like miniature analysis tasks for each little section. So they're bite-sized pieces. Uh, and ideally what you're seeing, this is this metacognitive process of like, this is how we would go about analysis. Um, we're doing it together. And then at the end of all of this, you have the option to write a pressy statement in response to the prompt and then outline what your body paragraphs might look like if you were to write this essay. This is, an, this is not gonna be graded, but if you wanted to do it and get some feedback, that would be um, a great way to practice these skills. And then there is a link here um, to some exemplars from this prompt from 2008. So you can see it is the nine point rubric, but it's still helpful for you to see like the good, the middle and the bad. Okay. So our first order of business, the opening passage. So the opening three paragraphs. And as you're reading this, I want you to, uh, for this particular section of text, jot down any words that stick out to you um, for whatever reason. Maybe they're repeated. Maybe they're in within a parallel structure that seems significant. Maybe they're metaphorical, whatever. Um, and then all you need to do is write down those words. And then what we'll do is share out after a couple minutes, either through, through the chat or um, audibly. Any questions on that? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and set the timer for um, probably two minutes and then that should be enough to sort of read three paragraphs and jot down some words that stick out to you. Isaac, um, what we're doing is on the screen. So just read those three paragraphs and then jot down words that stick out to you. About 30 seconds left. Uh, 
All right. Uh, what do we notice? What words stick out to you? And I think for the sake of this particular question, just unmute yourself and say the word or throw it in the chat and that should be sufficient. Okay, so strength and weakness, so opposites. Obstacles, doubt, forcefully, good. Embrace uncertainty, good. Good, so when you say anaphoric way, David, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Sure, so um, <clears throat> it says, um it is not to uh it is not the courage to venture into the unknown it is the courage to accept for his, uh, the the uh, so it's just kind of repeated in a way i guess good. it's not very but it's there good um we could also see parallel structure there as well right so it is this but it is not that or well i guess it's it is not that it is this which also there's another element there's another example of parallel structure in there. Does anyone know where it is? Is it when she says certainty creates strength and then uncertainty creates weakness? Yep. That whole first paragraph is parallel structure. So if you guys think back to that syntax as rhetoric packet, just like this huge packet that I gave you guys that we breezed through and that was going to revisit in class, but then this all happened. Um, the whole paragraph in and of itself of that first paragraph is parallel structure, okay? So certainty creates strength is coupled with uncertainty creates weakness. Certainty gives one something upon which to lean is coupled with uncertainty makes one tentative if not fearful. And tentative steps, even when in the right direction, may not overcome significant obstacles, okay? It's a parallel paragraph. And it also ends in a periodic sentence. Okay, where the, the main clause comes later. Uh, Katrina, you said something. Uh, yes, it has a positive connotation and uncertainty has a negative connotation. And then we learn in the second paragraph that the scientist's job is to engage with, embrace uncertainty. So it almost shifts our thinking a little bit, right? So he's glorifying the role of the scientists in a way. Very good. Yes, it is a very smart tactic. Um, and doubting as well. Doubting and uncertainty are, they're not synonymous, but um, it's cause and effect, right? Like doubting causes uncertainty. So um, there's sort of an interplay between those two things that cause and effect. All right, so um, here are some of the other things that hopefully you notice, right? So um, certainty and uncertainty are absolutely words that I would have circled here. Um, or underlined, underlined or whatever. Um, and then the unknown, I look at the, the names that are referenced here. I have no idea who Claude Bernard is, to be quite honest with you, but thankfully, uh, Barry tells us that he's a French, French physiologist. And then Einstein, we know, okay? So there, he's um, alluding to or referencing well-known scientists. Um, I underline these traits because he's telling us what it means to be a scientist. This is definition, right, um, as a pattern of development. Curiosity, passion, patience, creativity, self-sufficiency, and courage. Um, and then uh, the definition that he gives of the scientist is actually what's going to lend itself to the foundation of the rest of the argument that he makes, right? So he started... Uh, answering the prompt already. So if we go back to the prompt, how does he characterize scientific research? Well, for starters, you have to be curious, passionate, patient, creative, and self-sufficient, and courageous, and willing to um, sort of jump into the unknown. So even in just the first three paragraphs alone, we already have a pretty solid understanding of the rhetorical purpose here. The next step 
Um, so uh, lines 23 through 35. Um, I want you to, and this is another rhetorical analysis strategy, take the sentence and put it in your own words as concisely as possible. What is he, what is he saying here? Um, and then what we'll do once you've done that, we'll move into how he's saying it. So take a couple minutes to do that in your notes, and then we'll do the same thing. You can shout audibly or you can type it into the chat. Sorry, I navigated on the wrong window, so it disappeared for a second, but it's back. Oh, 15 seconds left, 15. All right, um, so let's see what kind of paraphrases we've got. Either um, unmute yourself or uh, Toss it into the chat. All right, so the purpose of a scientist is to explore the unknown in a concise, structured way in order to gain knowledge and further understand it. Good. So basically what you've just done is articulated his meaning. What else we got? All right, all scientists are faced with the unknown and even the smallest probing can lead to advancements and new discoveries. Good. So you've taken it as, um, so that the rhetoric here shifted for you in a way because you have talked about um, sort of the effects of this scientist engaging in the unknown and the effects are that there are advancements and new discoveries. Good, what else, anything else? So, um, 
if you're still typing, go ahead and keep typing. But um, here's what we um, hopefully ultimately land on, is the analogy that's being made between the frontier and scientists' existence and their task, right? So throughout this whole passage, um, he presents the scientist as if he were this pioneer exploring an unknown world. So this frontier, the idea of the frontier is super um, integral to um, sort of the uh, American dream, manifest destiny, all of that. It harkens all of those things. Um, so uh, there's an argument being made there that these scientists are the new pioneers. They are the ones leading us to progress um, because they are on the front lines and the frontier, uh, diving deep into a wilderness where they know almost nothing. They are creating the tools and techniques that they need to clear that wilderness because they don't already exist, so they're having to make it up as they go. Um, they are taking a single step, followed by a single step. So it's this incremental change, looking through the looking glass, which is both like microscope, but it's also an allusion to Alice in Wonderland, which implies unpredictability, um, chaos, confusion, and risk, right? So if you have seen the live action of Alice in Wonderland, or even the cartoon version, there's an, uh, when Alice is like plummeting into this new world, that's the sort of uh, image that we get. Um, and then uh, this sort of simile of like a crystal to precipitate an order out of chaos. They're sort of given this godlike thing, like who brings order out of chaos? Like gods do, right? So um, this is a glorification of the scientist. He is a frontiersman. He is a pioneer. Okay. A single step can also take one off a cliff. So this goes back to, um, let's see if I can pull it up. Um, what you guys were saying about the first paragraph, um, certainty, doubt, uncertainty, courage, all of that is embedded into what it means to be a scientist because a single step could lead to progress or a single step could mean you fall right off the cliff, right? So we're starting to see a development um, in his characterization of a scientist. And not only is it these traits that he explicitly states, but he, you, you are a pioneer on the frontier. The next section of the text, um, we're gonna focus on pattern of development. So if we were to take these two sentence, or sentences, paragraphs together, this one about the frontier, followed by um, this paragraph. How do they relate? What is the pattern of development? Uh, what is the line of reasoning? If I were to ask you to reverse outline this, what would you put in the margin? Uh, like paragraph that we just read, what is its purpose and what is it about? As opposed to the paragraph that comes right after it. What is its purpose and what is it about? So take, um, I'm going to give you a minute to do this one since it's one paragraph, and then we'll share out. Right. Go ahead and wrap up your reading. And as you guys are doing that, I'm just going to say, um, Maggie, yes, uh, your interpretation here that you put in the chat, that there are no guarantees in science. One experiment could change the world um, or mean absolutely nothing is um, absolutely a component. And it parallels exactly what is said in the opening. And Katrina, uh, you as well, um, they are not defined by how they venture into the unknown. 
Um, but venturing further into the unknown could end up redefining the research. Yes, so good insights there. Um, so what about this paragraph? The in the wilderness, the scientists must create. We were to consider the line of reasoning developed between this paragraph and this one. What do we got? I'm, I'm going to try to say mine. I'm not much of a writer. I'm, I'm a verbal processor. So um, sure. I just kind of said that um, in the last chunk, they described the effect of what the scientist does and glorified that. Um, and then in this one, they talk mm -hmm. about the process and go into the process of um, of that scientist, of that result, how they do that, how they accomplish that. And they use that and kind of pull back in the inquisition introduced in the first paragraph by using lots of rhetorical questions about like inquisition on um, and following that wilderness kind of analogy. Good. Yep, exactly. So if we look at this passage, what we're given is um, the original analogy, right? And so it's sort of definition process, okay? Um, and um, so it's giving us the, it's defining the terms for us. And then the next paragraph is essentially what it looks like in a practical sense. So it's further definition, but he's saying like, look, here's what it's like in the wilderness. Here's what the scientist is in the wilderness. He's the, the, the pioneer on the frontier. And here's what his day-to-day -day looks like. This is what the nitty-gritty grunt work, tedious work that a scientist engages in. And yes, um, exactly right, David. The second paragraph glorifies the difficulty of a scientist's job almost in a contradictory way because what he does is he says, look, it is not all rainbows here. Like it is not, they're not all in these shiny labs with lots of money. In fact, uh, they're out in the wilderness looking at rocks which does not sound like a very glorious job. So what he does is he removes our preconceptions about, look, like you think that these scientists are these highfalutin academics who like, um, like stick their noses in the air because they know more than you, when what they actually are, are pioneers on the frontier sitting down and staring at a rock and understanding it to its very minutia. Okay. So, um, as Trinity pointed out, there are a series of hypotheticals in the form of rhetorical questions. Um, there's this sort of motif of tedium or grunt work for gender, um, which very much in line with our idea of what the pioneer uh, frontiersmen uh, engaged in when we're talking about like settling the new world, for instance, uh, for example. Uh, mostly grunt work, mostly tedium, okay? Um, the scientific exploration that he's talking about, um, he, he's breaking the trope of that sort of hyper nerdy scientist who never leaves the lab, okay? Um, because if it weren't for the scientists that were out in the nitty gritty, getting their hands dirty, we wouldn't have the things that we have today, like, um, if we want to talk about medical progress, if we want to talk about just technical, uh, technological progress. Okay. And then he's using this mundane example of a rock to emphasize what he's saying, right? Like he can use any example about what a scientist explores. Instead, he chooses geological study because he wants us to understand like, look, this isn't like, there's no fancy bells and whistles here. We're looking at sediment, right? And that's an effective example to use to prove his point. It would be a completely different effect if he had chosen, say, a researcher who works on like, um, like neuropathological disease. So like, I use my brother as an example all the time because he's in, he's in medical school right now and he does research on neuro uh, physiological disorders and he does brain surgery on mice like that's really cool you're not going to use that example to explain how tedious scientific work is because that defeats the purpose so he has picked a very particular type of scientific research to illustrate his point okay that is a rhetorical choice you could actually um, use exactly what i just said 
in a rhetorical analysis as a part of your supports. The next task. Um, how are these two paragraph, uh, paragraphs developed? As in, what is the pattern of development? What is the line of reasoning that we see? What techniques or choices are being used to convey this point? I'm gonna give you two minutes to do this. This is the last section of the passage, and so then we're done with the uh, lesson part of this, and we'll move on to the next thing. So two minutes. What do you notice about how his ideas are developed in these last two paragraphs? And Katrina, I just saw your response. Yes, uh, the convenience of being able to complete multiple tasks with a single tool. Okay, what do we notice? Okay, so he first heightens the role of the scientist with the idea of the unknown and then in a contradictory way elaborates uh, on the minutia and blandness of the job while still glorifying it, where they work to how they work. Okay, good. I said, um, for me, kind of, he brought the analogy of the wilderness to a conclusion and kind of that glorification. So paying it back to the beginning when he introduced it. And then mm -hmm. after that, um, redefining the exceptionalism of that scientist even though he does bring back to the fact that it's mundane and the work sucks um he talks about how basically how the scientist is glorified in that and wi willingness to do that good good um what would we say if we were to talk say um a single word about what this first paragraph is about 49 lines 49 through 55 what what one word does it address We can't figure out the first paragraph. Let's look at the second one. What word is, what concept, or what is addressed in the second paragraph? What is he talking about in the second paragraph? If we could put a single word to it. Okay, so uncertainty. And we know from the first paragraph that uncertainty is weakness. 
And what does he say about scientists who are unable to deal comfortably with uncertainty? What does he say about them? What is the result of their experiments if they cannot deal with uncertainty? So an element, there's persistence. Yes, we're almost there. So if a scientist is persistent, what, I don't know how to word this without giving you the answer. Um, persistence is required in order for a scientist to succeed, right? So the first paragraph here is about success, right? And then the second paragraph addresses failure, right? And so we have in the progression of this whole passage a definition of the scientists, um, of science itself, the nature of certainty versus uncertainty, and how science is in the realm of uncertainty. And a good scientist is one who can engage with that uncertainty in a meaningful way, um, like a pioneer on the frontier. And then he ends with ultimately, which tells us that's the key word that adverb there tells us. So um, ultimately, as in when all of this is brought together, right? If a researcher wants to be successful, right? He's met all the criteria that I've outlined before. And what will result from his success is a paved road over the path that he has laid, right? So because he has been successful in engaging with the unknown and being a pioneer, his colleagues will follow him and pave the road of the path that he trailblazed, right? And because of that, it'll become even easier for everyone else to benefit from that. And we see that in Henrietta Lacks, actually. That's exactly what happens. And so Henrietta Lacks would be an excellent support to use for this very particular prompt. I did not plan it that way, but here we are. Right? And then the second paragraph moves into the antithesis of success, which we know is failure, right? The opposite of success is failure. And he says, on the other side, so not all scientific investigators can deal comfortably with uncertainty. And those are the ones that are not creative enough to understand and design experiments that will illuminate a subject. In other words, if, you, if a scientist cannot deal with uncertainty and cannot think outside the box and persist in difficulty, they will not have experience, uh, experiments that are successful, right? So he's ending this passage with not only a definition of what it means to be a scientist, but how to be a successful one, right? And when we boil it all down, uh, you've got to have uh, a comfortability with uncertainty and you have to have confidence to persist despite that uncertainty, okay? Um, and really, if we wanted to label this device, we'd say it's antithesis. Right, which seems contra it seems kind of weird because we think of an antithesis as like a single sentence, but he has juxtaposed, so that's another term you can use, these two um, sort of end goals or ends of two different types of scientists. The scientist that meets all of the, the definitive criteria he's outlined in previous paragraphs, and then he ends with the scientist who does not possess those traits and is thus not as successful, okay? So holistically, we, we, we portioned the text, right? So if we go back to the very beginning, we've got the first opening passage that's chunked, then this next paragraph, followed by this paragraph, and then followed by his conclusion, right? And so if we were to write this essay in response to the prompt, uh, following this process, we'd have a pretty good understanding of where we're going to go, right? So we might say um, our main claim might be that he, the scientist, is a frontiersman um, or a pioneer on the frontier. Or to use the language of the prompt, we might say that scientific research is, uh, oops, scientific research is um, equivalent to the type of tedious work and exploration of the unknown. Um, that a pioneer has on the frontier, right? And so he ha we are answering the prompt using the language of the text and the language of the prompt, and then we're pulling from the text to support those claims, right? So your task, should you choose to accept it, um, again, this is not going in the grade book, but I want you to try writing a pressy statement 
opening your essay. Um, so that is a purpose-driven analysis of the text. Um, and then I want you to outline, so just bullet point, what your body paragraphs would be about. So I would suggest have your topic sentence and then list the evidence that you would use and um, some notes about the commentary you would use, but you're not writing a full essay. 